Hi right, guys. It is a hot, sticky summer day here in early March. That would be Friday, March 8th, 2024. Little dog and I are heading off to some sort of picking party. Imagine that. So uh, before we head off out into the woods, it is a Friday. So uh, after my preamble last night, Sancho, what exactly is going on here? Uh, we are going to get back to our regularly scheduled Friday ain't gonna happen roundup where good lord how many examples of shit that ain't gonna happen one two three four five six seven eight nine ten. got twelve we got a even dozen here so let me dive right into it because i want to spend a little bit of time on this leadoff piece out of cnn the the fake news network you know so there, there really are i mean all joking aside uh, there are millions and millions of Americans uh, listening at least to the uh, first half of this uh, and think this is unadulterated horseshit and then we will uh, get around to the unadulterated horseshit. But this is from this fellow up until yesterday. Had a lot of respect for a uh, climatologist named Bill McGuire. Bill McGuire is Professor Emeritus of Geophysical and Climate Hazards at University College London and author of Hot House Earth, An Inhabitant's Guide. There you go. And this is uh, Bill McGuire weighing in on the fake news network. Hmm. I'm a climate scientist. If you knew what I know, you would be terrified too. Are you frightened by climate change? Do you worry about what sort of world we are bequeathing to our children and grandchildren? In the words of science writer and author of The Uninhabitable Earth, David Wallace Wells said, quote, No matter how well informed you are, you are surely not alarmed enough Close quote. I would put it even more strongly. If the fracturing of our stable climate does not terrify you, then you don't fully understand it. The reality is that as far as we know, and in the natural course of events, our world has never in its entire history heated up as rapidly as it is doing now, nor have greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere ever seen such a precipitous hike. Think about that for a moment. We are experiencing in our lifetimes a heating episode that is probably unique in the last 4.6 billion years. While those of us working in the climate science field know the true picture and understand the implications for our world, most others do not. And this is a problem, a big one. After all, we cannot act effectively. We cannot act effectively to tackle a crisis if we don't know its full depth and extent. What is happening to our world scares the hell out of me, but if I shout the brutal, unvarnished truth from the rooftops, will this really galvanize you and others into fighting for the planet and your children's futures? Speak for yourself, breeder. Or will it leave you frozen like a rabbit in the headlights, convinced that all is lost? It is an absolutely critical question, with politicians and corporations unable or unwilling to take action rapidly enough to stymie emissions as the science demands. All we as climate scientists are left with is to seek to rouse the public, to try and force through, rouse the public 
to try and force through via the ballot box and consumer choices the enormous changes required to curb global heating. But would telling it like it is do the trick? Or would the burden of truth be too much to bear? Yes. Uh, and they talk about this study we've heard a million times about how freaked out young people are about climate change. Uh, where more than half of young people felt overwhelmed and powerless to act. It would seem reasonable enough to argue on this basis that painting an even worse picture would not help. But if this is the case, does it mean we should not provide people with the full facts if they are too scary? Surely not. In fact, this is not, this is not a matter of scaring or not scaring people, but of informing them. As a climate scientist, it is my duty to tell you about what is happening to our world, whether it engenders fear or not. A failure to do this will mean that the public is left ignorant of the true extent of our climate emergency, which in turn can only hinder engagement and action. This is already becoming a problem with many commentators <coughs> on the right of the political spectrum, along with some climate scientists denigrating as doomers, denigrating as, quote, doomers, ha, huh? anyone flagging the worst outcomes of global heating. Such climate appeasement is increasingly taking the place of denial and could be an even greater driver of inertia than fear as it plays down the enormity of the problem. Yes, and as an inevitable consequence, the urgency of action. The truth is, the truth is that people can take being scared if they know there is to live. If they know there is to live. If they know there still is and it still is who still is who still is who still say that there is still hope and that they can do something they can do something to make things better or at least stop things from getting worse yes a 2022 study by researchers from the University of Bath found that scary images of wildfires and other climate-related catastrophes around the world were particularly effective at cultivating climate anxiety. Yes, the chronic fear of environmental doom. Rather, then leading to inaction. However, this study showed that this could be a motivating force that spurred people to adopt measures that helped to reduce emissions. Yes. Critically, the authors of the study observed that the reality of climate change has to be communicated Yes, has to be communicated without inducing a feeling of hopelessness. And this is the key. One of, one of the ways of doing this is to encourage collective action. Many people have said to me that they feel isolated or that as individuals, don't, they don't think they can make a worthwhile indifference worthwhile, yeah, a worthwhile difference. My answer, my answer is always to join a group, join a group of like-minded people and work with them 
to drive institutional and systemic change. Yes, in every case, this has had a galvanizing effect, replacing her, replacing hopelessness with her, replacing hopelessness with her, replacing hopelessness with her, with her, with her, with hope. And inertia with action. The bottom line is that many things in life are scary or worrying. From going to the dentist, yes, to noticing a potential sign of cancer, but ignoring them almost invariably results in something far worse happening down the line. Yeah. So, uh, I guess according to Bill McGuire, uh, understanding that the planet is going Venus is about the same as worrying about going to the dentist. We have going to the dentist in this hand, the planet going Venus in this hand. So, if you can handle going to the dentist, you too can go find a dentist to do this. Climate change is no different than, uh, you know, going to the dentist. Everyone has the right to know the facts, scary or not, so as to provide the opportunity to act, to act based upon the reality of what we are doing to our planet and not some sanitized version, rather than leading to inaction, I believe this could be transformative. Thank you, Bill McGuire. So uh, let's figure out some things that we can do. So apparently this is uh, this article uh, here. Uh, this is how we can collectively work with other people to save the planet. You've heard of these things called called uh, called quilting bees. You know where these little old ladies sit around a big table and they sew these little squares of cloth together. A quilting bee. So now we have you can join, but instead of making you know like a queen size quilt. Uh, we're going to make, we're all going to get together, we're going to join a community quilting bee, but we're going to make some curtains. We're all going to get together and collectively act to make some curtains. Yes, scientists want to build a 62 mile long curtain around the Doomsday Glacier for a $50 billion Hail Mary to save it. Yes, we are going to save the Doomsday Glacier by wrapping a 62 mile long curtain around it. Yes. Geoengineers plan to test massive underwater curtains that could slow catastrophic glacial melting. Yeah, so everyone grab your needle and thread and join with like-minded people to make a 62 mile curtain to wrap the doomsday glacier to keep it from melting. All right, but if quilting bees are not your your uh, your cup of tea, I don't know. How about joining with your neighbors to develop a floating farm out in the middle of the ocean? Scientists develop promising prototype for self-sufficient floating farm system. The ocean's bountiful water supply is a clear solution. A floating farm 
prototype is showing promise as a solution to potential food and water sh shortages. Yes. Mm. All right, I love it when they ask a question. This is right out of Yahoo News, still asking the question, can we suck CO2 out of the air to reverse climate change? The answer to the question, can we suck CO2 out of the air to reverse climate change is no, but the good folks at Yahoo News are not going to take no for an answer. The idea of removing carbon dioxide, the most common greenhouse gas from the air, is not far-fetched. There you go. Mm -hmm. But we got one that we do have a little bit of a problem. Uh, a little bit. A new study suggested that removing CO2 will be more expensive than previously believed. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, I think we've worn the can we suck CO2 out of the air to reverse climate change into the ground. But, uh, you know, the, the problem with all of this shit is we keep looking outward for answers when we should be looking inside our own bodies <clears throat> for uh, how to save the planet from fossil fuels. Researchers develop promising new battery using substance found in our blood, researchers at the University of Cordoba in Spain have developed the first biocompatible battery, and it runs on hemoglobin. That's right, the kind in our blood. Though the concept sounds like it comes straight out of a science fiction ain't gonna happen film, the use of hemoglobin as a biocompatible compatible catalyst is, quote, quite promising for battery-powered devices in the body such as pacemakers and prostate massagers, according to researcher Manuel Cano Luna. Yes. Okay. But now we're going to go from inside our own bodies we're going to zip right on past our own planet, and we're going to go to outer space uh, for uh, this way to save the planet is to look to the stars, or at least to the satellites. Scientists are testing miracle material. Yes, a miracle material for power generation in space are encouraged by the results. Quote, this shift could redefine the solar industry landscape. Yes, get used to hearing perovskite. Perovskite, I didn't say how to pronounce this word. P-E-R-O-V-S-K-I-T-E, -E, solar cells could be the next big thing when it comes to clean energy, offering improvements in weight, flexibility, and range of applications compared to their silicon cousins. But before they conquer the Earth, they're going on a few little voyages in space. Now, no, uh, this rant would never be... Uh, complete without checking in with the single biggest uh, techno-optimist, clueless moron writing for uh, Medium.com, Will Lockett. The untapped carbon-neutral 
energy source that can power humanity twice over. Deep sea geothermal could be an utter game changer. Yes. Geothermal power doesn't suffer from any of uh, all those problems that all those other things suffer from. Yes, but it's only viable in a few locations on Earth. So how do we solve this conundrum? Well, a new form of geothermal energy is gaining traction that promises to be the ultimate clean energy <coughs> technology. Deep sea geothermal energy. We're going to start building power plants at the bottom of the deep blue sea. And if they don't get run over by one of these, you know, deep sea mining trawlers, uh, if they don't have a collision, the, you know, the, the deep sea geothermal power plants being built by uh, mermaids, uh, as long as they don't get hit by a deep sea mining trawler to dig up all of that stuff to save the planet, then uh, we're going to do all right. All right. You know, I've, I've been talking for years uh, about this unadulterated horseshit called carbon offsetting, but organic valley dairies. They also, uh, Organic Valley Dairies, they understand this carbon offsetting horseshit is horseshit. So at least they know that. So if carbon offsetting is horseshit, how about Organic Valley tries carbon insetting, carbon insetting to reduce dairy's carbon footprint and help its farmers. Carbon insetting happens when a company reduces emissions in its own supply chain, not someone else's. So what they're doing is they are planting trees. Yes, uh, this is one of their participating farmers, Farmer Gretebeck. Quote, we just put little whips, meaning little seedlings, in the ground in 2022, and everybody understands they're not going to collect a lot of carbon right now. But in 15 years, when these things are rolling, it's going to be beautiful. In 15 years? Okay. What is going on with offshore wind power? It looks like the UK government has announced a new 800 million pound. You know, that, that it's very unfortunate how they use the word pound. I don't know how many dollars, you know, we're talking a British pound, whatever that means in dollars. Uh, developers are being offered $800 million uh, pounds in support for, a, for new offshore wind farms as part of a record one billion pound backing for green power. Yes. Uh, but it also revealed there has been a delay to the competition to build small nuclear power plants, so-called small modular reactors. Yes, so long as we're on nuclear power, finally, you know, I, I have mentioned how there are a few articles uh, 
and being honest uh, about what ain't going to happen. So this is from Salon asking the question, is nuclear power a fix for climate change? Experts think it is too dangerous. As the climate crisis grows worse every year, alternative energy options are increasingly important. Much recent debate is focused on nuclear energy, which has an understandably troubled reputation after the disasters at Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima and is further tarnished by its association with the devastating potential of nuclear we weapons. <clears throat> nuclear energy is cleaner than fossil fuels in terms of carbon emissions, but most experts Salon contacted were skeptical that it can offer a path to climate salvation. Yes. Uh, this uh, I'm just gonna look look at one of these. Uh, we're gonna hear from M. V. Ramana, a physicist at the University of British Columbia, and author of a new book titled "Nuclear Is Not the Solution: The Folly of Atomic Power." in the age of climate change. Quote, if one evaluates nuclear energy as a way to deal with climate change, he said it actually plays, quote, a negative role in reducing emissions. Um, anyway, this is all broken down. Uh, he cited the variety of risks and environmental impacts associated with nuclear energy, including catastrophic accidents, the fact that fuel for nuclear power can be diverted to weapons programs, and the production of radioactive waste, which can remain hazardous for thousands of years. I think we've heard that. But speaking of radioactive waste remaining active for thousands of years, what is going on over there at Fukushima? It is going to be the 13th anniversary of Fukushima. We're three days away. So what have we accomplished in 13 years? <clears throat> 13 years after the meltdown, the head of Japan's nuclear cleanup is probing mysteries inside reactors. Yes. As Japan prepares to mark the 13th anniversary of its worst ever nuclear disaster, the man in charge of cleaning it up says his team is fighting to bring a sample, meaning the first at 13 years, they still have not brought one sample out of the heart of the site's radioactive debris. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so, about 880 tons, 880 tons of highly radioactive melted nuclear fuel remains inside the three damaged reactors. But no one knows to this day what condition the melted fuel is in or exactly where in the reactors it fell. Huh. That data is crucial to make a plan to remove it safely. Yes. Uh, critics say the 30 to 40 year cleanup target set by the government and TEPCO is overly optimistic. The lack of data, technology, uh, and plans on what to do with the fatally radioactive melted fuel and other nuclear waste at the end makes it difficult to have a clear view of how the plant and its surroundings may end up when, meaning if, 
the cleanup ever ends. But we're going to wrap up today's Ain't Gonna Happen uh, with this article from The Guardian about AI, about artificial intelligence. This was uh, one of Elliot Jacobson's on his list of Ain't Gonna Happens. AI is likely to increase energy use and accelerate climate misinformation. Unadulterated horseshit claims that artificial intelligent artificial intelligence will help solve the climate crisis are misguided with the technology instead likely to cause rising energy use and turbocharge the spread of climate disinformation. A coalition of environmental groups have warned. Uh, advances in AI have been touted by big tech companies and the United Nations as a way to help ameliorate global heating. Uh, and then you're know, talking about how Google is climbing on this bandwagon, blah, blah, blah. However, a new report by Green Groups has cast doubt over whether the AI revolution will have a positive impact upon the climate crisis, warning that the technology will spur growing energy use from data centers and the proliferation of falsehoods about climate science. This, this story is all about Jevons' paradox, although you will never see Jevons' paradox mentioned in the story. <clears throat> this is Michael Koo, Climate Disinformation Program Director at Friends of the Earth. Quote, we seem to be hearing all the time that AI can save the planet, but we should not be believing this hype. It's not like AI is ridding us of the internal combustion engine. People will be outraged to see how much more energy is being consumed by AI in the coming years, as well as how it will flood the zone with disinformation about climate change, close quote. Uh, the burgeoning electricity demands of AI means that a doubling, a doubling of data centers to help keep pace with the industry will cause an 80% increase in planet heating emissions. Yes. In the U.S. there is already evidence that the life of coal-fired power plants is being prolonged to meet the rising energy demands of AI. And just three years from now, AI servers could be consuming as much energy as Sweden does today. Anyway, guys, we could go on and on, but I'm not sure my camera has even made it. So uh, I think we've heard enough for one day about ain't gonna happen. Uh, I gotta wrap this up because I guess some sort of music festival is gonna happen uh, tonight. And uh, we gotta head through the hot, sticky summer day of March 8th to get there. My guys. <clears throat> 